Aloha! Steve Cullen back here with you with another tutorial on Nightscape Photography. In this tutorial we're going to spend some time talking about how to properly plan and shoot meteor showers. And then once you've captured some awesome meteor shower images, how to process those images together to make some stunning final pictures. Okay, so let's get into talking about how to properly plan and prepare for going out to shoot meteor showers and then what to think about when you're in the field. So first of all, location. Location is very important. You want to spend some time thinking about where it is you want to set up to shoot, what you're looking for in your composition, where the meteor shower is going to be taking place. And so this is something we'll talk about here in just a minute, the radiant of the meteor shower and where is that located relative to what you're shooting. And so spend some time scouting and looking for some interesting places to shoot. And also, since it's a meteor shower, you're gonna wanna be away from bright lights. So out in the country, away from the city, away from car lights somewhere where you have some dark skies and this might go without saying but if it's cloudy out you're probably not going to see a lot of meteors so take a look at the weather before you head out to shoot just to make sure that the skies are going to be clear enough for you to actually capture something. Be comfortable. You're going to be outside under the stars and of course it's going to be amazing and beautiful but it also might be cold. You also might have mosquitoes and bugs by you if you live in warm climates. So make sure that you plan for comfort because you're probably going to be outside for a while, if not an hour, maybe two, three, or longer. And so just make sure that you plan ahead, bring warm clothing if you're going to need that, bring bug spray and repellent if you're going to need that, and just plan ahead for your own comfort while you're out there. It'll make it a lot more fun. It may not be the most interesting investment that you'll ever make for your photography, but buying a great tripod is really important. It will make your life so much nicer when you're out in the field trying to get set up, trying to get that shot to know that you've got a tripod that you can depend on. There's nothing worse than coming home from a night of shooting to find that all of your images are unusable because your tripod's been bounced around by the wind all night. And so have a good sturdy tripod for any kind of nightscape photography and meteor shots in particular since that's what we're talking about now. It's a great investment for you to make. Storage. Make sure that when you go out into the field you always bring some extra memory cards. They're known to fail at exactly the wrong times and that means while you're trying to shoot meteor showers after you've driven 50 or 60 miles out to the country and you find out that the memory card that you have been using forever finally gave up the ghost. So always make sure that you bring some extra memory cards along with you out to the field and double check that they're, they're good before you head on out. And the same goes for batteries. Always make sure that you bring extra batteries with you. Make sure that you charge all your batteries before you go. Good idea for all of these things that we're talking about right now is a checklist. Make a checklist of things that you need to make sure that you have in your camera bag or loaded in your car so that you know that you have them when you head out and so that you don't have that disappointing moment when you go to set up to find that you've got a bad memory card or that you've forgotten batteries or that you've forgotten to charge your batteries. So always, always, always make sure that you bring extra batteries and that they're fully charged before you head out the door. An intervalometer is an invaluable piece of gear to have for shooting meteor showers. And once again, for any nightscape photography or time-lapse photography, you really can't get by without having an intervalometer. Whether it's an external intervalometer or a lot of cameras these days, have one built in and so you can take advantage of that. But make sure that you have a way to remotely fire your camera 
and to set it to fire it at certain intervals over a certain period of time. It'll make your life so much nicer when you're out in the field and actually gives you the opportunity to enjoy the sky while the camera is doing all the heavy lifting. Lenses. We could talk for a long time about what to look for in lenses, especially when it comes to nightscape photography. There's a lot of inexpensive lenses out there, and I'm a bit of a lens snob, and so I think the lens is by far the most important investment you can make if you're going to have any kind of focus on nightscape photography. Yes, there's some inexpensive lenses out there that are nice wide field, fast optics, and they're decent for the money. But if you really want the high quality final results, you want to make sure that when you're investing in your camera gear, that you spend the majority of your investment besides on your camera body, on lenses, and you don't need to buy a lot of them. I usually only shoot with one or two or three lenses at most for most of my nightscape work. And so it's not like you have to have 50 lenses in your kit in order to get the shot. You probably will only use a handful of them. But you want to look for fast optics. And so for nightscapes, you really want to shoot at f2.8 or below and try to get lenses that are in the f1.4 range if you can. They're going to be more expensive, but they're going to be worth it. You also want to make sure that you've got few lens elements. The more lens elements, pieces of glass that make up that lens, the more light that's going to be knocked down by the lens and that is always a bad thing when we're talking about shooting in environments where there's very little light to begin with. A couple of other things you want to look for in your lenses. You want to look for coma. Coma is the little seagulls that you see in the edges of your pictures or usually in all the corners of your images that if you've ever done any nightscape photography you'll see the stars and they've got little wings on them and I call them seagulls and that is coma. It's a distortion of the points of light that every lens has but some lenses have it more than others. One way to fight coma is to stop the lens down but of course that then lowers your light gathering capability. So there's always trade-offs. That's one of them that you run into with your lenses is, is coma versus stopping it down to clean up the coma. The other thing that you want to look for are chromatic aberration and spherical aberration. So chromatic aberration will be when you zoom into a point of light or really any object, but stars really exhibit this, you'll see fringing, either usually green or purple fringing around the stars. And that can be cleaned up in post-processing, but it's always better to try to get lenses that have the least amount of chromatic aberration. And the similar idea with spherical aberration, and that is when you look at your images that are taken with a lens with high spherical aberration, the stars around the edges will all appear to have trails on them that will appear to radiate back to the center of the image. And again, all lenses distort your images to some degree. So it's really just about getting optics that are going to give you the best opportunity to capture the light when you're out shooting nightscapes. Now as far as the settings are concerned, you want to make sure that you're shooting at as high an ISO as possible without getting too much noise introduced into your image. Now we're going to show you some techniques in post-processing to lower the amount of noise and boost the amount of signal in your images that I think will help, but you still once again want to start out with as clean an image as possible. Typically for shooting nightscapes, we will shoot at somewhere around 3200 to 6400 ISO. You'll want to play with your camera before you go out to get the shot to make sure that you know where that range is on your camera to give you the best light gathering, 
the best light sensitivity and the least amount of noise. And again, it's one of those trade-offs in nightscape photography that you're going to have to find where that point is on your setup. For nightscapes, we also shoot for anywhere from, let's say, 10 to 30 seconds, depending on the focal length of the lens that you're using. If you're shooting with a 20 millimeter lens, for example, you can probably leave the shutter open for about 20 to 25 seconds. If you're shooting with a 14 millimeter lens, you could probably safely shoot for maybe even up to 25 seconds. So there's a rule that we call the 500 rule for nightscape photography, and it goes like this. Take the focal length of your lens, let's again use the example of a 20 millimeter lens, and divide that into 500. And that gives you the amount of time that you can leave the shutter open on your camera without getting star trails. So to recap on lenses and settings. For your lenses, you want to look for as wide angle lenses as possible um, with limits. So typically for nightscape photography, we'll shoot between 14 and 24 millimeters. You'll want a fast lens. So something with optics in the f2.8 range or better, f1.4 is even better. You'll want to invest in lenses that have minimal amounts of distortion, whether that's coma, spherical aberration, or chromatic aberration. And then the settings on your camera. You'll want to make sure that you have a camera that can shoot at least at ISO 1600 and preferably 3200 up to 6400. You'll of course want to check to make sure that the noise signature is acceptable at those higher ISOs with your camera, but that's the range you're looking for. Now let's move on to talking about some of the particulars in getting the shot. First of all, the radiant. Now to describe the radiant and to talk more about that, let me jump over to another application called Starry Night, which is a planetarium application that will do a good job of describing what the radiant is and how it moves throughout the course of the evening. Well, here we are in Starry Night, which again is a planetarium application. And what we want to do is show you what the radiant is and why it's important to know where the radiant is for your meteor shower images. The radiant is an area of the sky where the meteors will appear to originate. Radiants are named, or the meteor showers themselves, are named for the area of the sky, typically a constellation that the meteors seem to come from. And so, for example, with the Perseid meteor shower, the meteors will all seem to come from this region of the sky. If you were to track 10 or 15 of the meteors, no matter what their trajectory is across the sky, they should all point back to the area of Perseus in the night sky. So that's what the radiant is. Again, just simply the area of the sky where the meteors will appear to originate from. Now that you know what the radiant is, it's important to know that the radiant will change its location in the sky over the course of the evening. Of course, this is due to the rotation of the Earth. So as an example, here's the Perseid meteor shower radiant on August 11th, 2016 at about 11.15 in the evening. It's relatively low on the northeastern horizon. Now as the evening goes on, you can see that the radiant will get higher and higher in the sky. And all the while, the meteors from this meteor shower will continue to point back to this radiant no matter what its location is in the sky. And this will cause some interesting challenges for processing your meteor shower images. We're going to show you some techniques on how to deal with that moving radiant through the course of the night. Okay, so now that we've talked about 
how to look for the radiant and understand where it will be in the sky so that you can properly compose your shot. Let's talk about focusing. It's so easy to go out under the stars and end up with an out of focus shot. And so it's very important to remember to always take your time before you start shooting to get good focus on your camera. And there's a really great technique for this, especially if your camera supports live view mode. And so let's jump on over to a video to take a look at exactly how it's done. We're going to use live view on the Nikon D810A to pull up a view of the sky. And let's zoom in just a little tighter to frame just a couple of stars in the field of view. And we are already in rough focus, and so we're just looking to get much tighter in on the stars and get a good view of whether they're in focus or not. So now we're going to adjust the focus, moving the focus ring a little bit at a time until the stars pop into view. And you'll notice that the background stars become much more visible once we hit focus. And then we're just going to zoom in a little tighter. We'll move the focus back and forth on either side of the focus point just to make sure that we've got it where we want it. And then we can zoom back out and we're ready to go. We've got the camera all focused and we can now move it to any part of the sky to take our images. So that was the live view technique for focusing under the stars. There's some cameras that don't support live view and so you have to find another way to focus. One trick might be to focus during the daytime on an object that's far enough away that you're reaching infinity focus on your camera. And then you can mark the lens at that position so that you know that when you move the focuser to that specific spot that your lens will be in focus. Some lenses actually have the ability to move the end of the focus ring to that spot and lock it in so that when you rack the focus all the way out you know that the lens is focused for infinity. So far we've talked about a lot of different topics ranging from the best location to get your shot, the gear that you want to bring out to the field with you to make sure that you're prepared, the lenses and settings for your camera, where the radiant is for the meteor shower so that you know where to point your camera. And we just talked about focusing and some of the tips and techniques to make sure that your camera's in focus and you get the shot that you came for. So the final thing I want to talk about is creativity. And there's not a lot I can say here because this is what's inside of you when you're taking photos. And so it's all about applying your passion and your skill and knowledge and creativity in composing the shot the way that you envision it to be. And so make sure that when you're shooting nightscape photos or meteor shower photos that you continue to apply the creativity that's in you for getting the shot. And I guarantee you if you do that, you're going to have a great time and you're going to have excellent results. And so that's it for the introduction of how to shoot meteor showers. In part two, we're going to talk about how to process your images once you've been out in the field and captured some amazing shots. So we we'll look forward to seeing you in the next tutorial processing your meteor shower images. Aloha.